name is Valia, and can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So I'm my mother's daughter. <laughs> Same last name, genetically very similar. Um, and I have a very interesting bit of information to present to you guys tonight. It's taken me many years to put together this particular presentation, and um, I'm very excited to be sharing it with you today. Just as a question, how many of you have children in your lives? Whether they're your own nieces, nephews, your teacher, grandchildren. Let's see, a show of hands. OK, so quite a few of you, like most of you. All right, well, the subject of my talk is helping children to eat healthier. Now, how many of you have noticed that uh, <laughs> children don't really seem to like eating healthy. Let's see another show of hands. How many of you have noticed that? OK, we've all noticed that. It's not unique to this culture or any other culture. Uh, it's a global situation. And it's quite a significant problem, because if our children don't like eating healthy and they eat unhealthy, what happens? They get sick. So it's estimated that about 80% of children don't like vegetables. What kind of a future are we going to have if our future doesn't like vegetables? <laughs> I mean, we're talking like the foods that they need to be healthy, to thrive. And we want them to eat healthy foods because healthy foods make, them, make our children healthy, and every parent Every guardian, every aunt and uncle wants their children to be healthy. So after um, having lots of lectures all around the world, I noticed an interesting phenomenon. Parents would approach me at the end of each lecture, and they would say, how did your parents get you to eat healthy? And after a while, I started getting fascinated by this question. Like, this is actually, this is happening a lot. So I took my video camera, and I went around the world, and I filmed and interviewed children of every age, from the age of two, when they're just starting to talk, all the way up through teenagerhood to the age of 19. And I asked them, what can you do to eat healthier? And a little, little five-year-old said, I could eat more fruits and vegetables. And a teenager said, I could stop eating at the restaurant where I work. A little girl said, I could eat less salt. I thought, hmm, they seem to be health experts. These children know, they know what to eat. They know what healthy food is. I asked them, do you want to be healthy? Because a lot of adults believe children just don't care. And they said, yeah. And I said, why? And they said, one little girl said, I want to be healthy because I want to live a long time and I want to see more things. A little boy said, I want to play baseball when I grow up and I have to run really fast for that. A little girl said, I want to be healthy because I love climbing trees and I still want to be climbing trees when I'm 100. So this is what I discovered. After countless interviews, hundreds of interviews with children of all ages, I found that the number one reason children don't like eating healthy foods is they don't like being told what to do. That's the reason. In fact, children know how to eat healthy. They don't mind healthy foods. In fact, they're naturally drawn to many of them. It's that very pressure, that very intention of molding and shaping and forcing. It's that very intention that corrupts their relationship with health and healthy foods. So today we're going to talk about um, what really works and what doesn't work. So force and pressure yield only temporary compliance and quickly turn into rebellion. Like your children, they may temporarily go along with it. Um, there's many ways to get them to eat vegetables, like traditional ways, like 
offering them a reward for eating their vegetables or possibly a punishment or complimenting them or um, talking down to them or having a serious stern conversation. And all of these, can you feel how all of these strategies have a little bit of motive? And can you imagine how you react when someone comes at you with something similar, when they want to push something on you? Maybe a common one that, as adults, we get threatened with is exercise. <laughs> well, you should exercise. How do we react? We get very defensive. And teaching children that they are being good when they're eating their vegetables and rewarding them uh, for eating their vegetables only teaches them to lie. It teaches them to get clever about fooling you and going around the rules and the laws because their freedom is still more important to them than any kind of um, rigid ideologies. And it's very interesting that control always equals corruption. You can see this on a large scale when, say, a dictator comes into power and tries to control the people. What we notice is that as a society, there will start to be more corruption, more bribes, more crime, uh, more not very good deeds done for the sake of monetary gain. And the same thing can be witnessed in a small family unit. When the parents are controlling, the children are very good at lying, very good at not getting caught, very good at being sneaky. So interesting that it just clearly leads to corruption. Control and corruption, they're linked. So how do we turn this into this? And that's the main focus of my talk today. The most effective way we can teach our children about health and nutrition is to communicate to them that we love them unconditionally, regardless of what they eat, regardless of what they do, because in reality, our love is unconditional. However, most children, when asked in countless studies, studies have shown that they don't know they're loved unconditionally. They need to be told. Just imagine for a moment that you are unconditionally loved and that you are just loved for who you are, for what you are, and you don't need to be different, and it's okay to be how you are. Just imagine that you are unconditionally loved. Can you feel the pressure of life and life's problems lifting off of your shoulders? If you were completely loved, would you make different choices? Would you change your career? If you were completely loved, would you eat differently? Can you feel how in that position, knowing that you're loved suddenly, there is time to go for a walk in the morning. And there's time and there's room for you in your own lives. And those things that you put off that you want, you wanted to go to that musical concert, but you were too busy and you have responsibilities and you, have, and you didn't go. If you were loved, there would be room for that. And, and it's so apparent. Can you feel that? It's, it feels different. So when we communicate to our children that we love them unconditionally, this is the weight that is lifted off of their shoulders. And what we are left with is a desire for what's right and it, what's good. We are left with what's natural for us, which is to take care of ourselves. Here's another great way to help children uh, learn about nutrition, and that is to teach them the facts without the manipulation. Because when it comes to nutrition, there is no need to make anything up. Nutrition is magic. For example, you see this little girl, she's eating raspberries. 
You can tell your children maybe before a PE class in school, raspberries stabilize the rhythm of your heart, therefore improving endurance and they'll help you in, a, in any kind of physical test. And bananas, bananas are loaded with potassium and potassium improves your brain functions. It's been studied that children who eat a banana before an exam, they do better on that exam. It's really, really cool. Actually, bananas supply the electricity, the electrical currents that um, your neur the neurons in your brain use to transmit information. Bananas. And watermelon. Watermelon is packed with vitamin A. Vitamin A is required for your eyes, to have healthy eyes. And vitamin A actually is responsible not only for forming a picture in your brain of what you're seeing, but it's also responsible for dimming and um, brightening light. Like that function on your camera, that's what your, the retinas in your eyes do, and they need vitamin A to do that. The first symptoms of a vitamin A deficiency are poor night vision and squinting in bright sunlight. So if you're going to the beach, you can say, you can uh, take a watermelon with you instead of sunglasses. And when people wear sunglasses at the beach, they're more likely to burn because their body is getting the message that it's evening. And, and their body stops doing what it needs to do to protect itself from a sunburn. So if you bring a watermelon, you're less likely to have a sunburn. I mean, nutrition is so fascinating. Zucchinis help carry hemoglobin through the body. And for athletes, this is really great information because what happens when you start running up a hill, eventually you reach a point where you're tired. That tiredness is when the oxygen is not able to carry, it's, it is not carried well through the body. Those tired muscles that refuse to fire um, are deprived of oxygen. So zucchinis help circulate oxygen through your body, thereby being the best energy boosting, energy lasting food for athletes. And this is, this is nutrition, it's that easy. I witnessed an incredible thing. One time I was uh, doing a juice fast with a group of people. And that day at lunchtime they were serving beet juice, beets and apples and lemon. And the lady in line in front of me, she took a tall glass of beet juice and she took a sip and she made a horrible face. And she said, this is the most disgusting thing I have ever drunk in my life. Why are they giving us this? Who can drink this? And she, with disgust, she picks up her glass and hands it back to me and says, do you think you could drink this for me? And I said, sure, of course. She was kind of taken aback by my response. And she said, well, why is that? Why do you want to drink that? Because I already had my glass, now I had two. And I said, well, beets are rich in iron. And iron is responsible for building red blood cells. And iron deficiency looks like exhaustion, depression, and anemia. She said, I have all three of those things. She grabs back the, the beet juice and takes another sip. And she says, wow, this tastes so good. I love how good this tastes. I wonder if I can have another of these. I'm going to make beet juice when I get home. And I thought to myself, wow, that's the power of knowledge, of knowing, of understanding, going from, I hate this, this is terrible, to this is the best thing I've ever tasted in a flash. And that's how it is with each of those things. If there are some vegetables that your children don't like, without pushing the, them to eat those vegetables, you are free to, in a gentle way, educate them. For example, celery is one that children often have a tough one with. And celery is a really great one um, because celery actually keeps your joints healthy and it prevents all types of um, joint pain. All types of arthritis can be reversed even by eating celery. 
as we go through life and we experience um, the knocks of life, we have some injuries, some car accidents, or we eat things that have a lot of salt in them, there's a small buildup that starts to accumulate around our joints. And that buildup can be made up of different things, sometimes just extra calcium. So when you roll your neck and you hear that popping noise, that's actually a little bit of buildup there. And celery dissolves that, and it gets rid of it, and it makes your body feel like it's 10 years old. If there's one thing all nutritionists agree on in the world is that celery is good for you. And for those of us trying to lose a couple of pounds, fun fact is when you eat celery, you're burning more calories than you're consuming in the act of eating celery, which is pretty great. Um, it's a great food for like those moments when you have to engage in unconscious eating, like when you're driving late at night and you need to stay awake. Um, celery is a great one, just a nice bowl of cut celery or like that popcorn reaction. Maybe your friends are making popcorn and you are trying not to eat popcorn. Celery is a good one <laughs> for you. In the absence of force, children are drawn to what's naturally good for them. This is something that can be trusted. You can count on this. And let me show you what is, this looks like in an example. Let's say you make a smoothie in the morning, and most of our children, let's just assume that our children at this current state are resistant to eating healthy. That's the state most of our families are in right now. If you make a smoothie in the morning, you're making it, you try to make it very delicious because you know somebody might be tasting it with sensitive taste buds. 80% of children are bitter sensitive. Maybe put a little apple juice in there for some sweetness. You make the smoothie and you offer it one time. Would you like some smoothie? No. Sometimes that no, that first no, is going to be pretty aggressive when it comes at you. This goes for spouses or <laughs> resistant siblings <laughs> as well. <laughs> Just that one time, you offer it one time, that's it. The next morning, when you're making another smoothie, you may offer it one time again. Would you like some smoothie? No. You'll notice the intensity of that no will be softer the next day after you didn't push it. Because if you say, no, but I really want you to have so many, and you just go on like this, and oh, we just have a little bit, just a little bit, just a little taste, just a little cup, it's really good for you, it'll really make you feel good. That is what's going to do this. So offer it one time, no, and just watch. Just conduct this experiment at home. One week later, when you say, would you like some smoothie? You'll get a yes at the end of the week. Some tough cases with very strong-willed human beings, it may take a little longer than that, but not much longer. So you'll notice that the absence of force, people are just naturally drawn to what's good for them. It just leaves them no other choice but to be curious about what you're doing. Besides all the health benefits, you will obviously be showing off <laughs> by that point. And it won't be long before they say, Mom, can you make me a smoothie? It won't be long. It's, that, it's just that absence of pressure, absence of force. Um, I'm talking about the complete absence of force. I mean, if you have a little baby, yes, you can put the green smoothie in their bottle and have them drink it that way. But after the age of five, a hu it's, research has shown that a human's personality has been formed by the age of five. And at that point, it's time to start respecting their will and helping children make their own choices, because that's really the goal here, not the mindless obedience of authority. It's helping them make choices, because you won't always be, be there next to them controlling what they eat or deciding for them what they eat. It's about helping them make their own choices. That's what will serve them most. And not only choices, but getting in touch with their inner ethics. It takes quite a bit of observation and introspection to find those ethics and be in touch with them. Once the child is in touch with what's OK with them and what's not, and they're good at listening to themselves inside, they cannot live an immoral life. They cannot make immoral choices once they are just clear, illuminated about their own nature, which is compassionate. Children are naturally attracted to the colors and 
flavors of fruit. Evidence of this is that candy often imitates fruit. How many times when we go to the store do the children say, well, they're looking at candy, candy bars, and they always say, I want the cherry one. The cherry one? I want the blueberry one. I, I want the strawberry one. I want the strawberry flavored, whatever. Well, I mean, the uh, marketing people have already known this long ago. And yeah, they're targeting our, <laughs> those children uh, very effectively. Uh, instead of buying them strawberry flavored candy, just go for the strawberries. A lot of times, those are actually the children's nutritional cravings. They're actually not craving candy. They're actually craving strawberries. And here's an interesting story. This happened to me. This is in, from my own personal life. Um, when my family first changed our diet, and I don't know if you know the story, but we became raw foodists altogether because my brother uh, developed type 1 diabetes. And he was found unconscious on the bathroom floor in a state that was similar to a coma. And um, we radically changed our diets. And he became um, diabetes free within months. Uh, but right away, we all changed our diet together to support him. And also, everyone else in my family was also very sick. So coincidentally, it really it was needed. Um, we started eating raw foods. My brother, Sergei, started craving mangoes and blueberries, mangoes and blueberries. And this was in January. Eventually, my mother said, this is getting really expensive, mangoes and blueberries in January. I didn't want mangoes and blueberries. I wanted figs and grapefruits. Figs and grapefruits, figs and grapefruits. I could just eat those grapefruits like there was no tomorrow. And my mom said, they're bitter. How can you eat these bitter, sour grapefruits? And I said, they don't taste bitter and sour to me. And I just kept eating them. And years later, my mother was studying with Bernard Jensen, who is a famous doctor. And he was famous for his extensive research. And he had written big, thick books compiling all the research and all the studies that he did. And my mother said, well, my son had diabetes. What should he eat? What would be good for him? And he looked in his big books, and he turned the pages. And he said, mm, looks like he should eat more mangoes and blueberries, because they restore the pancreas and lower the blood sugar. And she said, well, my daughter had asthma. What should she eat? Oh, and he kept looking in his book. And he got to asthma. And he looked down. And he said, oh, she should eat more figs and grapefruits, because grapefruits are one of the best foods for dissolving mucus. And when you get asthma, you actually have accumulated a lot of mucus in the lungs. That's <clears throat> mostly what asthma is, is just that accumulation. And you know, asthma is a very interesting condition. Like if you were your body and you had a lot of mucus coming in, like mucus forming foods, and you were binding the toxins together with mucus, um, and you were creating more mucus than you could than you could get out, where would you store it? Can't store it in the heart, can't store it in the brain, can't store it anywhere. Oh, there's a little room in the lungs. There you go, asthma. Grapefruits dissolve mucus, and, and so do figs. They're incredible for restoring the lungs and, and getting rid of that extra garbage there. So after that experience, I never, you know, never say to my niece and nephew, oh, you want raspberries? Well, that's just too expensive, <laughs> you know? Because there are, the study of nutrition is a young science. It goes so far beyond our comprehension of it, our shallow, narrow, limited comprehension of it. But our bodies know. I mean, you saw those white blood cells that my mother was showing you guys. Don't you think that's amazing? They're, those things are living inside of you as if they have some kind of consciousness, taking in garbage to protect you and taking in, like, like say, like Windex or toxins when they encounter those. They die. They sacrifice themselves to save you every day. They're doing that, whether we know that or not. I mean, that's just, that just blows my mind. 
And the same thing with um, all those healthy things that we crave. I'm not talking about donut cravings here. That's a little different. Uh, but when we crave like onions, for example, or um, tomatoes, there's always a nutritional reason. I find it fascinating that sometimes we forget why we eat. We think we eat out of pleasure, out of um, bonding with other people, or to celebrate, or to feel better, feel comforted. Why do we eat? Because our bodies require nutrition every single day in order to remain alive. They require nutrition. Um, that's why we eat. The reason we need to consume nutrition and fuel. So one common mistake parents make is they make healthy eating unappealing. And this is a great example. Look at the smoothie. How many of you had a yum reaction when you saw that? <laughs> I mean, it looks awful. And I don't even know where that is. Is that in the bathroom? <laughs> it just, you know, used beer mug, half full. It looks like it's a grainy smoothie, very pulpy, probably strong wheatgrass flavor. <laughs> I mean, no wonder our kids run from the room when we turn the blender on. So 70% of ch kids are bitter sensitive, which means that bitter foods such as broccoli and cucumbers really do have an unpleasant taste for them. The fruits and vegetables, that's an accumulated, um, accustomed taste that as our bodies um, mature and as we start to recognize certain foods, nutrition, the nutritional values of certain foods, we begin to like them more. For example, um, those of you who are not familiar with, say, every single green in the store, every single type of green, I'm talking like cilantro, parsley, kale, let all the different lettuces, uh, dandelions, um, dill, and arugula, and oregano, and all of that, I encourage you to, over time, um, try every single one of those. And even go in the store and take little pinches and taste it, just so your body recognizes it. Because you will notice before long that you'll go to the store and you'll just have one clear cilantro and it'll be really clear. Cilantro removes heavy metals from the body. It's one of the only plants that can do that. Other than cilantro, the heavy metals are sticking around. They're not going anywhere. And cilantro has the power to remove them. And heavy metal poisoning is pretty serious in today's world with the exhaust of every car expelling heavy metals into the air onto the ground. And heavy metal poisoning looks like a very fragile skeleton like shattering bones and um, problems with the central nervous system. Also, all kinds of Alzheimer's and mental problems. It was pretty serious. Um, and cilantro is a great one to reverse that. So kids will actually, they'll develop their flavors as their body says, oh, OK, OK, celery's good for this. Oh, OK, great. Now I, I kind of am starting to develop a taste for that. First, they're going to like the fruits first. And here's that same smoothie presented in a different way. Look at this. This is really beautiful. It's very appealing. Just that little bit of decoration really takes it from ugh to yum. How many of you have ever taken a green smoothie to work? Anybody? So you, you remember the comments that you got that day? <laughs> Whoa, what are you drinking? That looks like pond scum, or toilet sludge, or you know, I've heard them all. Adding just a little bit of decoration, or in fact, going to the store and buying a really beautiful bottle will solve that problem. Also, one thing you can say that's really helpful for coworkers is, oh, it's just a fruit smoothie. I put some greens in it for nutrition, but it just tastes like a fruit smoothie. You say those exact lines, like write down that quote <laughs> and deliver it. They'll be like, that's brilliant. That's what they'll say instead of like, oh, that's gross. They'll be like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> so yeah, present, presentation, look at that. I mean, it's, what a difference. 
Green smoothies are a great tool in delivering a high volume of nutrients in a delicious way. Now, imagine this. The nutrients in a green smoothie are being served to your body on a silver platter, all ready to go. So your body can literally be like, ah, oh, calcium, and put those on that hip. Ah, oh, fiber, I'm gonna clean out one of those arteries. Oh, okay, copper, okay. Iron, let's make some more blood cells. This is going to the brain. This is going to the, that pinky toe where the toenail has some kind of problem. This is going to repair that joint in the back of your neck where you had that car accident 10 years ago. This is going to repair the eyes. This is going, I mean, you put the smoothie in, it goes whoo, out to every direction. And if you think that eating a salad is the same as drinking a smoothie, think again. That salad dressing on the salad, first of all, calorie-wise, a hamburger and the salad at McDonald's have the same amount of calories. In fact, the salad sometimes has more than a hamburger because that dressing has so many calories in it. And what fat does is it pretty much coats all of the nutrition. It's so hard to digest the, those fats, the oils, that you're maybe getting 10% of those greens. And you have to chew them very, very thoroughly in order to break the cellulose walls, the cells of the, the greens. In the green smoothie, the absence of fats makes it easy to digest. 20 minutes. Maximum absorption. It's a very powerful tool. And, um, and it's really great for children because it just delivers for the whole day, you know. Here's another way to serve green smoothies to your children. Feel free to get really playful with it. Um, one thing I like to do is also make a green smoothie pudding where you just eliminate the water and put the fruit on the bottom and start blending it, then add the greens. Then you have a very thick pudding. And it's because there's no water, it's really sweet. Children really like it. It has a very pleasant, smooth texture. It's like applesauce, only it's green, which is easy to overlook considering how good it tastes. A lot of parents often don't realize that fruits are just as nutritious as broccoli. I mean, there's kind of a hang up on the broccoli and the zucchini and the Brussels sprouts. Yeah, those are nutritious. But look at watermelon. It's one of the most alkalizing foods in the world. It's alkaline enough to neutralize a steak dinner, which is the most <laughs> acidifying food available in the world. And for example, blackberries. Blackberries are named one of the world's, no, the world's healthiest food because they contain more antioxidants than any other food that exists. Those, um, especially when they're really, really ripe and sweet, like on the vines which grow wild here in Michigan. Um, and what do antioxidants do? They keep your cells from experiencing oxidation from having oxygen damage, thereby keeping you young forever, preventing wrinkles, preventing memory loss, um, keeping your skin elastic and your eyes sharp. I mean, those antioxidants, they're there to repair and keep you young. And now the, the trend is in makeup. They'll say, oh, this makeup is loaded with antioxidants. I bet you it's not as loaded as those blackberries are. Um, yeah, they probably have just like a little drop of <laughs> blackberry extract in there somewhere. Some fruits can compete with the best desserts. Like you cannot improve upon a tree ripened fig. Figs grow here, right? Figs grow here. You just can't, can't improve on it. I mean, it just tastes like delicious. And um, I had some raspberries from your store today um, that were so sweet. I just ate a whole little box on the way here. Teaching children about health in a loving way can be a priceless bonding experience. Um, have you ever seen a child holding a little chick? A little yellow, little tiny little chicken in their hands? Um, it's a wonderful thing to witness because you get to see human nature for what it really is. 
There is no reason why the child should care about this creature. They were not taught to care. Um, they're not forced to care. They're not threatened if they don't care about it. They just do. They just care about it. They want to love it. They, lo they just can't help themselves. They already love this little chick for no reason at all. It's an amazing thing. My, my parents started taking me to um, a farm nearby nearby our house and we'd go to this farm um, sometimes two or three times a month and we'd get to my brother and I would get to pick up the little baby goats and if you've ever picked up a baby goat you'll know that it will nibble on your ear and it'll breathe on you with its warm breath and it'll nuzzle your nose with its velvety little pink nose and it'll make little noises and this is the kind of thing that helps children build their understanding and their relationship around food and the food world um, in a very lasting, very impactful, powerful, nonviolent way. Children love when you pay attention to them. Include them in the green smoothie making process. If they're two or less, if they're just a baby, teach them how to peel a banana. It's completely safe and put it in the blender and teach them how to wash things. Um, as they get older, like four and five years old, it's time to start teaching them to use a knife and handle a small paring knife. Children will quickly learn it. I started using a knife when I was very, very young. And I mean, I can peel things like nobody's business, like one, two, three, it's done. Um, and, and this also includes them in the food preparation process. The average number of minutes per week that parents spend in meaningful conversations with their children is 3.5 minutes. Considering it's those conversations that shape their character, uh, that's not very much, not very much time at all, especially when you compare it to the amount of television they're, being, they're watching. Getting kids involved in the kitchen is a great way of teaching nutrition. This little child is making some wheatgrass juice here. Um, and they love it. They love to make it. I actually went to a raw foods um, daycare in Leverett, Massachusetts, where um, the kids were growing their own wheatgrass and juicing it themselves. And they were drinking it. Um, they had a little a daily little thing where they'd, the teachers would use a dropper and say, where are my little birdies? And they'd open their mouths and get wheatgrass dropped in. <laughs> so get creative with it. This is an ebook that I wrote. It's available at our website, rawfamily.com. And I put this together, especially if you're looking for recipes um, that are kid friendly, that children will like right away. Um, and all the tricks into making them sweet, making them a nice texture. And this is a book, it's available today. I wrote this book about unconditional love because once again, the most important way to help your children eat healthy is to help them understand that they are unconditionally loved no matter what they eat. And in this book, it's based on real events, a little cat, which I happen to own, uh, keeps getting into trouble and he makes a mess of the house and he makes a costume out of this little girl's favorite curtains and he does all this mischief and he asks, will you love me still? And she says, yes, I will always love you. And I can't tell you how interesting it is to watch a child read this book because as they flip through the pages and the cat says, will you love me still even if I make a mess? Children will say, no. And they turn the page, will you love me still even if I um, don't like baths? No. And they'll get, they'll get to the end where the girl says, I will love you. And they go, Whoa, what? It's like a surprise ending. They didn't see that coming at all, you know? It's very powerful and it leads to great conversations with parents. So that's available today. And in conclusion, these are my last and final points. Let your children know that your love is unconditional and that it is not dependent on what the child is eating. Encourage choice making and conversations around choice making. Make healthy food appealing and delicious. Get children involved in preparation, grocery shopping, and gardening to help them experience the food world for themselves. 
and gently educate them with fun, simple facts that are easy to remember. And this will work. Thank you. Okay. Yes? I hope you get children into meaningful conversations. Ah, how do you get children into meaningful conversations? That's a great question. Um, how many of you have experienced this? It's the end of the day, of the school day. The child comes into the house, and you say, how is school? And they say, fine. How many of you have gone through that? Everybody? Or maybe your husband comes home from work. How is work? Fine. So that's actually not a great conversation starter, <laughs> as, we, as we're discovering tonight. I invite you to ask your children questions that are really interesting, that spark conversations, um, questions you yourselves would like to answer. One of the questions I like is this one. With what do you hear your thoughts? Because you don't need your ears to hear your thoughts. But that would suggest that you don't need your ears to hear. And it just leads to a very interesting conversation. What, with what do you hear your thoughts? And if you close your eyes and you can still see with your eyes closed, with what do you see your dreams? It's an interesting thing to consider. And all kinds of different questions. You know, even, even goes beyond looking for the right answer. I walked in on my mother talking to my nephew the other day. I, I come in, and it's my turn to babysit, and she's talking to my nephew. And she says to him, why do ducks quack? And he says, well, ducks quack because they have something stuck in their throat. And they're trying to get it out, but they can't. And they all have the same problem. But we still love them because <laughs> it's not bad when people can't talk. And we still appreciate them trying to con converse with us. And I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter why ducks quack. That's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> Just if you ask them, if you inquire, if you ask interesting questions, they will give you their whole world. And you'll get to see things in an incredible way. Um, one little girl I was talking to, she was um, very interested in beauty. And I said to her, um, well, what makes women beautiful? And she says, it's the noise that their high heels make. Because <laughs> that's what makes women beautiful. And when I grow up and I'll wear high heels and I'll walk to work, I will also be beautiful. <laughs> you'll, get to, you'll get to hear things from a completely new way, really valuable things. So I invite you to just figure out some really intriguing questions and um, get to know your children and the children in your lives. Do you have any other questions for me? Yes? Uh, babies, um, how soon would you introduce the smoothies to babies? At approximately six months, when they're starting to eat solid food. Um, you can put it in their bottles. You can spoon feed them. Um, and this is an amazing thing for babies. Also, during um, breastfeeding, it's important for mothers to drink green smoothies because it will help their children sleep through the night and it will help them have better bowel movements and um, it will help them have less um, skin rashes, like it will eliminate skin rashes for babies, which is very common. Um, and it will limit uh, tooth pain when the teeth are coming through. And actually green smoothies even earlier, you know, are great for mothers who are pregnant pregnant women because greens contain vitamin K, which is a nutrient that is very hard to find in the food world. And vitamin K is responsible for um, building cartilage and for shaping beautiful faces in babies. Um, but yes, at six months, they can start drinking the smoothies. And you'll notice that your babies will be the healthiest in their percentile. Yes, I, I would recommend starting um, a little bit gentler with the greens. Maybe start with the lettuces. And uh, be sure to rotate your greens, of course. Maybe a little bit of spinach here and there, some lettuce, 
um, use different kinds of lettuce, um, and then start working your way into some of the other greens. Um, there's a few greens that have a delicate flavor, like chard is another good one. Uh, you can blend wheatgrass in the blender. Just cut a few blades and put it in the blender. That's a good one to use. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll be around if you come up with something. Thank you so much.